Uh, John and I are going to, to do a section now on uh, our draft administrative guidance 15. And um, John's going to help me as my scribe. So this is, this is supposed to be a, an exercise session. And uh, in fact, there's going to be a little bit of uh, presentation uh, in advance of the exercise, just because a lot of people don't know what's in admin guidance 15. <laughs> Uh, so admin guidance 15 is the, the document that's supporting applications to the director for pre-approvals under uh, item 1 of table 2 of protocol 6, and that's the item that talks about uh, where responsible parties haven't completed delineation or remediation of the entire extent of contamination. It uh, could be the relief valve item. I guess they all are in a way. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the purpose, the regulatory context, the scope of the document, reporting expectations, and scenarios. And we're a little short on time right now, so I'll try and go through uh, this, this preamble quickly so we can get to the exercise. And uh, feel free to ask questions either as I'm talking or after I'm finished. So anybody catch admin guidance or admin bulletin one? It was up on the web. It says it was, uh, came into effect, I think, on March 1st. I'm not sure it was even on the web on March 1st, but it uh, came off the web shortly after that. There were some errors in it, so it's gone. It's evolved multiple times. We're now on uh, draft uh, admin guidance 15. I'm not sure what version it is. Uh, I gave this talk ab about a month ago at GeoEnviroLogic, and things have changed in, in the months since I gave that talk, including the title. Uh, so approvals not to delineate or remediate the entire area of contamination at a site. That's what it's called. Um, and it describes situations where a director may recognize that full delineation or remediation, the entire extent of contamination, is not possible or appropriate for purposes of issuing an, a legal instrument. So I'm talking about AIPs and COCs in the context of P6, but admin guidance also addresses uh, approvals that would support um, applications for site profile releases. So that was one of the things that we added in when we pulled admin bulletin off the web and, and started um, putting it into a, a longer term guidance document. So you're going to have to bear with me. I'm going to give you some regulatory context because it, it, it's important. And uh, this was an opportunity. Um, so uh, Protocol 6 says uh, in Section 4.5, subject to Section 4.6, an applicant who is a responsible person for the source of contamination with respect to an application for an AIP or COC is responsible for the delineation or remediation of the entire area of the contamination, including at a parcel and that which has migrated from the parcel to neighboring parcels. And this has appeared in uh, various uh, iterations since uh, 2003 in this blue box at the bottom. Addressing the entire extent of contamination has been required in Protocol 6 since 2003. And it's just something we missed in the, in the earliest version of the protocol. But it flows from the legislation. And so the, the provisions I've... I've got there at the bottom of the cited paragraph, IMA 1, that's your definition of remediation. And in, in particular, CSR 59, that's the detailed site investigation uh, provisions in the regulation which speak to delineating the lateral and vertical extent of contamination, including where that contamination has migrated. So that's very important. Um, and DSIs are required for AIPs and COCs. You can go look at the language. I, I decided to pull it out of this talk. But... Uh, those are sections 47, that's AIP, and 49, I've got the wrong section here, 49 is for COCs. Um, and everybody here knows we've been challenged on this provision. I mean, it's accepted within this room for purposes of Protocol 6. You, you can't go beyond that protocol, so you're restricted to making applications that deal with the entire extent. But just, you know, from this regulatory context perspective, we've been challenged and um, it's understood from the last appeal that we uh, have a decision on that that, that section 59 that speaks to what constitutes a DSI, even though it's the only thing that speaks to a DSI, it has a, um, a prerequisite, I suppose, coming into it in the legislation about um, an investigation order. So if you've, been, you've received an investigation order, then these are what constitutes a detailed site investigation. So you're going to see 
that we'll be invoking those investigation order provisions much more liberally now than we have in the past until we can make amendments to the legislation to make sure that a DSI is a DSI is a DSI. So when we issue responses to site profiles now, we've changed the language to, to ensure that it is a lot stronger around the obligations to complete uh, investigations. Uh, there's an exception I note here at the bottom again, there's an exception introduced in Protocol 6 version 4 way back in the, in the uh, early uh, versions, early years of, of uh, our CSAP process here, and I'll get to that, but, uh, so, so just hang on to that. And it, it kind of relates to this corollary. So this corollary to um, 4.5 and P6, it, it flows with the legislation as well. So. Um, this is a bit of a challenge. Just read. I've, I've, I've played with the language. So subject to 4.6, any applicant who is not a responsible person for the source of contamination with respect to an application for an AIP or COC is not responsible for the delineation or remediation of the entire area of contamination, including contamination at a parcel and that which has migrated from it. So is that correct? Steve, is that is that right, Steve? I had a question yesterday. A guy bought a property and agreed to pick up the contamination liability, but he wouldn't be a responsible person. Would that be according to the definition of that? So he was asking, am I responsible for delineating all the downstream? And um, uh, I, said, I said, really, it's a legal question because you're not a responsible person unless you've signed something or other making you one, it would seem. Uh, Okay, you see so it off the hook? it's a good question, and it's a legal question for sure. So I'm not going to answer a legal question. I'll give you that. But as far as what's required for an instrument under P6, this that's my question here. So I'm going to keep going, and maybe we can discuss your question afterwards. But uh, the yes or no to okay, here it is. This is this is yeah, I'm getting there. <laughs> Um, so we're talking about instruments, what's required for the director to issue an instrument. We're not talking about responsibility. Sorry, Steve, that's why I'm evading your question. And, and so the issue is, yeah, if you're not a responsible person, you, you're not responsible for the source, which is a different site than your site you're making an application for, and you're not a responsible for everything that's migrated that's not on your property, but for the director to issue a certificate of compliance or an AIP for that property, the director has to know that the requirements of the... Oh, I'm stuck in... It's not moving forward. Try something else. Okay, well, the, the, a legal instrument confirms that the CSR standards and procedures have been, in the case of a COC, or will be met on the parcel for which they are issued, regardless of responsibility. It's not a vehicle of assigning responsibility. It's a vehicle of saying a site's clean. So that, that's the answer there. Legal instruments confirm that CSR standards and procedures have been or will be met on the parcel that they are issued for, regardless of responsibility. So for, it might be an affected par parcel, but in order to get a COC or an AIP for it, you have to meet the requirements to, to get the instrument. And then you have to deal with those, the, you know, get it, seeking compensation from the responsible party in a different process. That's a civil process. So back to, you know, if you're following the flow here, I'm jumping around a little bit, but in uh, P6, that section 4 or 5, that prohibition clause, it's a subject to. So it's subject to section 4.6, which takes us now in the current version to table 2, and right there um, in item 1 is this clause. If the applicant uh, is for the contaminated site legal instrument, there's a lot of language in here, is a responsible person for the source parcel and has not delineated and remediated the entire extent, um, you're able to seek uh, a pre-approval under certain conditions, although there's there's, it, would, it would appear to be completely open-ended in the protocol, which was a concern that we had fairly quickly on. Uh, so there you go. That's, that's where admin guidance um, 15 comes in. But you'll notice it, it does speak about a responsible person. So we're still uh, within P6, not really changing the fact that if you're not a responsible person, 
it is possible to make an application under P6 uh, for a site that doesn't deal with delineating the entire extent because you're not a responsible person. And that's really been the case that was recognized also very early on. And when I said there was an exception in 2004, in 2004 we realized that there were these innocent parties that also wanted to get instruments for their sites. And the bigger problem had never been resolved and it wasn't their responsibility. So we, there were, it was language that was um, also um, went through many iterations, lots of agonizing thought to come up with the right kind of language. And the last you, you saw it was the last version of Protocol uh, 6 had this provision for affected sites that allowed them to go through the process. It's not in the current protocol, but it's in Procedure 12. So it still exists. If you're not a responsible person, then um, you, you're not, uh, you, you can make applications through P6 as long as you meet the conditions to show your site meets uh, CSR standards. So scope of Admin Guidance 15. Admin Guidance 15 clarifies the regulatory context. Uh, it outlines the eligible applications and reporting expectations. So it puts some boundaries on that item, that relief valve in item one, but it also adds some um, clarity around uh, what's the basis for an eligible application. What, what do you need to provide the director? Um, consolidates miscellaneous director's approvals under a single approval process. So I talked about protocol six and site profile releases. Um, in both those processes, they speak about delineation of the entire extent. So there are uh, approvals under admin guidance 15 that would address uh, the, the various um, approvals that have been sought from the director for a number of years related to area-wide. Actually, I'll get to them on the next slide. Um, so it consolidates miscellaneous director's approvals, and it supports applications for both P6 and admin guidance 6. So eligible applications, these will appear familiar to you. Um, some we do more than others. Some we've been doing informally or formally, or um, you, you, it's just a whole hodgepodge of how uh, people have come to the ministry and, and uh, made requests to be able to go forward with various instruments where it's just not possible or appropriate to delineate or remediate the entire extent. So area-wide contamination, everybody knows that's where I think people are familiar with that term by now. It's where it's not wide area. Wide area, you've got a responsible party. But for area-wide circumstances, like Falls Creek Lowlands is the good example, you have very, very historic um, placement of contaminated fill throughout the whole area. There's no identified responsible party. Uh, former industries have come and gone. The current landowners are not affiliated in any way with who had placed the, that fill. So uh, in those decisions, the director would say uh, an applicant, in this case for a site profile release, is not required to delineate the full extent. They just have to deal with their property and meet the requirements for, in this case, for a release. Now, the reason I say release only is because you would be in that category of not being a responsible party if you were in a situation where you had area-wide, you're responsible for what's on your site, but not for what's off of it. So those kind of sites have gone through P6 in the past. It was just necessary to put all the technical arguments together in the application for why the contamination beyond the property boundaries is not the responsibility of the, the landowner. Um, merging plumes, that's a real tricky one. People have always wanted the ministry to be involved in, in those kind of uh, situations. But this is, you know, here now we've got it in an approval and, and some um, clarity around the requirements for making an application. Um, part site instruments, that's very common as well, and we've been doing that in various ways for a period of time. Um, denied access, so here you'll start to see a little bit of overlap with AG11. So that, that, that clause that prohibited applications coming through P6 where you didn't have written consent from the the um, affected property owner for, say, a risk-based instrument, um, that's, that, that's removed now in the current version of P6. So there's a little bit of overlap between AG15 and P6. Um, and technical um, infeasibility beyond the scope of technical guidance, you have the ability to use your professional judgment and document it well. 
put forward your reasons for using different approaches, but there could become a point where uh, you, you need to seek uh, pre-approval from the ministry. <laughs> You're just stretching it. Flow-through plumes, those are ones we've done for site releases. Again, didn't need to do them for P6, but this is a vehicle for getting a pre-approval. Beneficial use, we've done lots of reviews, ministry reviews of people with dealing with pilings, and you can't remove the pilings because DFO won't, will, won't let you pull the pilings, or those kind of things. Salt, salt's a big one. Um, so just so I can get, how am I doing for time? Are we going to have time to do the exercise? <laughs> Oh, that's a shame. Sorry, we build this as an exercise, and, and we're, uh, we're busy talking. Okay, well, I'll just really race through, um, because this is, this is the part that we're refining now. That's why we've been holding back on this, um, this guidance, because we've been working on it quite a bit. Um, but basically, the nuts and bolts are in a table at the end, and this is just a, a little snapshot of, of a couple of the, the um, options in that table. So there's um, denied access, what applicable lands. This would be, this says affected parcels, but you, actually it's wrong. It could be right and it could be wrong because there could be circumstances where you have denied access to one little site, and you don't want that to hold up getting your COC for your source site and all the other affected sites. So under each of these categories, there's many, many scenarios. And then on the right-hand side, that's giving you details on the kind of uh, reporting that the director would, would look for in order to issue one of these pre-approvals. And uh, so just to get to the back end of it, there's mentioned before about the approvals workbook. Um, we make these, all these decisions are publicly available. So you can see the director's thinking and, and what kind of requirements the director had in order to issue one of these approvals. Um, we need to update the workbook. We've got a lot of approvals that have been issued since the last time it was posted on the web. So we'll do that soon. Um, I had an example, but you know what? I am going, oh, it didn't come through very well in the transcript. But, but um, and this was for a part site, but I'm not going to go over it. Because, do, do I have time to do an ex uh, exercise? Coffee break. Okay, well, it's coffee break. <laughs> Okay, so um, last time I came to CSAP, I had way too many details in the example. Of it. So this time I just stripped it completely of all the details, and I knew we wouldn't have a lot of time. So uh, we've got a, a little board of paper over there, and um, I don't even think we've got time for doing table talk around this one. So we'll just do it as a, a, a room example. So here you go. And sometimes we get phone calls and there's not a heck of a lot more information than this. So here you go, you have a source site and then you have a bunch of affected sites and somewhere in there somebody needs refinancing or they need a permit, they need a COC and the work's not done yet. So what do we need to know? <laughs> there's the, you've got some information there. There's, there's a plume. There's a plume. But... What would the director need to know in order to say, here's your pre-approval, go get your COC for that affected site? And, and John's going to take note of your, your thoughts on that one. Well, you, okay, so there you go. Are there any wells? Is there any information at all on the affected site? That's a question. Is it just vapor, or is, or is it just water? Would there be vapors? How deep's the plume? Has the source been remediated? The questions are, what does the director need to know? And also, what would be the conditions under which the director would actually agree to issue? And, and if I go back to this table here, we're, you know, we're, we're kind of, ca so let's say the denied access. Well, we, this is the example I gave. We don't even know whether it was denied access or not. But demonstrate that all reasonable efforts have been made to delineate and remediate the entire area of contamination. I mean, that fits with the scheme, right? 
So then let's just overlay that question and look at the example. You have to demonstrate that all reasonable efforts have been made to, d to uh, delineate and remediate in accordance with the applicable tech guides and admin 11, which is your communication guidance, and then con contamination must be bounded on a gross scale. Well, that's not necessarily the same as the circumstance of this example, but the concepts of demonstrating uh, what's been done to achieve the regulatory requirements to the extent practicable in that circumstance. And if they haven't been done, you know, what kind of, what's the schedule? Are they planning to remediate the source site? <laughs> is that plume just going to be fed for in perpetuity? And is that acceptable? Or are there all kinds of restrictions on this certificate for the, the um, party that's, that's needing the COC? You know, I, I guess, it's an exercise. You need to know. You need to start thinking about what are the conditions that what, what's required in order to issue a COC for that particular site. Right, and there may or may not be anything up up upgrading or downgrading. Uh, presumably, if you can demonstrate that the that it's flowing onto your site by placing your wells and so on properly, and then you can determine what you have to do beyond that in terms of vapors or water or whatever. Um, and I've worked on sites where we didn't even know the, the source. It was just somewhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, you may never know. In this case, it's the re that you have to remember this is about the responsible person making the application. Ah, okay. Right? This isn't, this isn't the affected person. This is the source site owner who's making. Okay. And they're asking to be relieved of having to delineate and remediate the entire extent in order to get this part site. Then it has, has to do with being denied access. Um, oh, well, not necessarily. It's that they're, they're asking for the relief because P Protocol 6 requires, as the responsible party, they have to delineate the entire extent and remediate the entire extent before they can get an instrument. In this case, they're pulling out, one of the arguments is that it's an affected party. It's an innocent party. But the, other, but the other arguments have to be part of the app. In other words, they have to um, have s some information and some commitment to dealing with the entire extent. But they might not be there yet. Yeah, that's a, that's a question. That's a question. Yeah. <laughs> so because it's coffee break, I think I'll just go back to the example that I had, which is one, an approval that we actually granted, and it's not so different from the example that I provided. Uh, so there's an operating source site, and there's an affected parcel. There only was one affected parcel. There's not multiple. The, um, this, I'll run through the, op the operating source. The entire extent of contamination was delineated. Remediation wasn't possible on parts of the source site, but there was uh, a remediation, an extensive remediation effort that undertook to the extent practicable to remediate the source site. And the affected site was fully remediated to numerical standards. And there was a, a low-density polyethylene barrier installed along the boundary between the two. The affected party, the affected parcel meets all numerical standards for all media, so that includes the vapors. The groundwater gradient's away from the affected parcel. That's a little curious, but that's, that's what was presented. But, and then there was written confirmation from the affected parcel owner for the numerical-based COC. That one's kind of easy, actually. And so, in this case, the uh, approval was granted for the um, affected parcel, for this, the responsible party to make application on behalf 
of the affected parcel owner for a COC for their parcel. That's one example that's on the, the worksheet. Any questions about, and, and um, hopefully we will, we will get admin guidance um, 15 uh, finalized, and I think it'll have to go for public comment. The, the earlier bulletin was reviewed by CSAP, but um, I think this uh, guidance, because it's more substantial, will go for a period of public comment. But we're issuing approvals under that um, item one clause right now, so this is just, uh, and, and if you have questions, um, uh, give John or I a, a call. Thank you.